Guys, make some noise for Luca Lush. Hey. All right, so can I just acknowledge you for being right on time, which has not been a trend for these master classes? Yeah, I've been. So I appreciate that. Uh, so we have exactly half an hour for questions. So yeah, ask away. And also, um, well, you guys are gonna get a chance to like kick it with uh, Luca afterwards. So try to keep the questions production related. Um, and then you can nothing about, about drugs, please. Hey, thanks for doing this. Um, so you talk a lot about the uh, arrangement and some production te yeah. techniques already, but um, how about some sort of philosophy and mindset tips? I saw your oh, cymatics yeah. interview recently that you did. Oh, yeah, that was um, fun. And I really liked how you talked about like just your studio setup and like your yeah. workspace. Could you go a little more into like how do you set up your environment to be conducive to producing and how do you approach it from your mindset on how you get into the flow? Uh, recently, I think having plants and animals in your workspace is just fantastic. I have three cats now. It, it didn't mean to end up like that. I'm not that guy. I had a you friend who got deported and I inherited the cat. So here we are with three. But, it, there, you know, having stuff in your studio space that makes you feel relaxed and comfortable and ready to get to work and also able to take breaks. You don't want to, like, I used to be, like, a proponent of just, like, grinding it out, like, nonstop. But then I noticed that sometimes my tracks would feel a bit like clenched, if that's the right word, and not like as organic as I wanted them to be. And I would forget about some of the human elements of that. So I think that that's a really important thing is taking breaks. Yeah. Stepping away from a bit, taking a walk, you know, but also just make sure you're, you know, even if you're working in a, uh, you know, it's just your bedroom, just have everything feng shui really nice. Get some, get some mood lights, some LEDs. That really helps, I would say. Um, what else? Just uh, like a philosophical, like a mindset going in. Um, I guess it depends on like the track too, right? Because you want to like really involve yourself in the mood that you're setting. So like if I was making a really dark, horrific track, maybe I would put on a horror film in the back and just mute it, you know, something like that. Or a lot of times I have anime on mute when I'm making my music and that makes a lot of sense, I'm sure. But um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, dude, that was great. Thank you. Cool, thank you. All right, thank you for doing this, man. I've actually came here for my 21st birthday, so... Yo, happy birthday! Yeah. yeah! Thank you, thank you. And from Dallas, too, so... Oh, hey, yeah. what's up, man? But uh, I came to ask this question about uh, Sucker Punch. Oh. How did you uh, make that with uh, Little Texas, that uh, chord progression of... Um, oh, the chord bump, progression. Bump, bump, the, uh, we could try opening it up, but I have no guarantee it'll sweet, open. Sweet. If you can open Let's that. try. I waited for that song for, like, three months. Yeah, let's try but, opening it up, but no promises, because... Uh, Microsoft decided to delete my entire downloads folder on an update like two days ago. And I was like, oh, but thankfully all of this was already stored uh, elsewhere. Where was it? I filled project files. Let's look. Uh... <laughs> anyway. Let's see how long it takes to open it up. But, uh, It's gonna take forever. That's why I like preloaded it for this other one. So with FL, like it just like I don't know. It's it's file organization is really nonsensical. But if you like zip it up, then it like chooses everything to be uh, located at one location. So, um, but that track together that came together so fast. <laughs> like I literally like. I've been friends PM. with him a long time, and I was just like, oh, I really fuck with what you're doing right now. Like, and I just made something that day, and I sent him a clip, and he's like, yo, let me come over. Let's work on this right now. <laughs> and it was like done like under a week. So, Redo. oh, it's going to load, I think. But Sam is classically trained. So uh, we were listening to some French core stuff, and he was like, we should make uh, like a progression in this vein. And I was like, all right, cool. And I'm self-taught, so my grasp of music theory is not the best. But uh, that's the thing. As long as you can articulate like the the what you're going for, it's okay. I think I've I've you know I don't know if you guys like know further enough back in the discography, but I used to work with like brass tracks a bit more, and they're super jazz trained and so good. But like I remember coming in to working with them, and I had a bunch of chords set up for this remix or whatever, and they're like. 
just throwing all of these terms at me. They're like, oh, I like how you did this modulation with the key. Oh, blah, blah. And I was just like, oh, wow, uh, sure, yeah. Totally did that on purpose. But it's just developing an ear, right? So like, if it sounds good to you and you do it consistently, that's fine. Was that your Takes melody the with the brass chords? Oh, the brass. Yeah, like was that the, him or was that you? That was uh, it was kind of like we did it together, you know, it like was both of y'all. Yeah, yeah. Together. That was like a nice session where it was very fluid between the two of us. Uh, the drop in itself, like the build to the main drop and stuff, I had written that when I sent it over to him, and then we made the second part of that drop where it has the strong uh, upbeat. That was like, it's like that's my sound. Punch. Let's do it. Yeah, that's pretty dope. <laughs> it's really funny because I was talking with. Uh, my manager, and he was like, just bring in God's plan because that's probably what people want to hear. People don't want to hear your hardcore track you just did. <laughs> like, <laughs> we do, though. No, yeah, yeah it's it like a platter. It <laughs> just took forever to load. Jesus. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> this is why you shouldn't use FL, like straight up. All right, so let's just go through this real quick. Was there a specific part of the track that you wanted to... The second, the second drop is actually second drop, better. Second yeah. drop, like with the machine gun? Yeah. That yeah, one. okay, so that was like another found sound type thing. There's this old metalcore band called uh, War From A Harlot's Mouth, and I had a bunch of their old music, and there's one song where they literally have like a breakdown, and it's just a machine gun. And I was like, that's hard as hell. Like, <laughs> so I was like, we should do that, but with this. So that's where that idea came from. Oh, some parts are missing. I knew. What What's missing here? A drum loop? Yeah, it's... Uh, oh, well. But, yeah, basically, it was just a, a machine gun sample. And this was a sample from, I guess, something that got removed that I got to find again. Um, but it was, like, basically just a kick drum that I applied a ton of, like, wave shaping distortion to that gave it that character. Um, but you could probably do it with any sort of kick drum and then just, like, slam it through... Like I was, I was being experimental with this track, um, where I wanted to distort the hell out of it in Paler, which is just like let's try just putting any old kick drum in there and see if that has like the same effect. Um, where's a kick from here? I gotta sound a little different. Uh, hold on. Let's just use the the God's plan. Yeah, turn it up, but the same thing you basically get. So yeah, that's that's the idea behind that, right? Is that you just throw your kick drum into a fucking wall of distortion to get that sort of sound. Um, I'm sorry that parts of it weren't. <laughs> still saved. Again, my computer deleted a bunch of stuff recently. Um, was there any other questions you had about that track, or was it just the distortion on that? Or No, that, that, I think that should be a good. Appreciate cool. it. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> well, who else? Uh, so I've had previously used FL Studio. Hi. I started on it and then switched in. Good choice. <laughs> have you tried organizing yes uh but the thing is i work very fast and sporadically so a lot of times it will be very unorganized this one i don't even think i used my template for because i just like popped it open and i was just like trying to write it down as fast as i could so things were a little bit less organized that's what i do like about ableton is it does force you into uh, a bit of organization with saying that every channel on the uh, x-axis is associated with a given mixer channel. So you never have to fumble around like I was doing before, being like, where is this located with that and stuff? Like, that's just an inevitability of FL. But the nice thing is that you can kind of work faster in FL. It's a little looser. So, you know, there are pros and cons. Uh, that's good. Anyone else have any questions? Or? Hey. What's um, up? So I wanted to ask about your philosophy for like, let's say, um, are you more of the type of person that 
works a lot on something then takes takes a takes a few days off or are you more of like do you have a schedule you produce every single day and yeah what's your philosophy I think it's important to try to produce every day. Sometimes with touring and stuff like that, you get a little hectic or like life events. But ideally, I think you should be putting in as much time as you can every day because this is like your job, right? And like you want to be the best you can be. Like obviously there are a lot of things out of your control like to whether or not you're able to make a living in music. But the one thing that is in your control is, you know, fulfilling whatever the maximum potential that you have as an artist on the music side. So to do that, Yes, you want to produce as much as possible. As to finishing tracks, try to do the 72-hour guillotine sort of thing, um, which is like you put in just as much work as you possibly can into that initial creative spurt to get the main ideas of the track done. It doesn't have to be totally done in that time, I would say, but like you want to be, when you come back to that track, maybe you know a month later or two, you only want to be doing minor changes to it that you could do in one session. Maybe just tweaking the levels a bit, adding like a fill here to there, things like that, but not like grand sweeping changes. That's, I find, the most effective way to work, but you could be different. Everyone's different. Um, but I always feel like creatively, if you come back to an idea that you had like a few months ago, you're not going to be viewing it in the same way that you did when you started the track. It will become a different track. That can be good and that can be bad. So, and then quick follow-up question to that. Um, I saw this Ill Gates video where he talks about splitting up like your technical, like sound design and mixing, yes. and splitting that with your creative stuff. Do you? I one hundred percent agree with that. I, I I think I've watched the same video, and that's what I was so saying. Great. Yeah, it's great. You, you should yeah, you should take days where you literally just make weird sounds and save them and render them out, and then have them in a short folder. So when the inspiration strikes, you can be like, "Yep, here we go." And I remember I made this sound here, blah blah, and you piece it all together. And it's a lot faster and seamless. I've definitely like lost. You want to stay in that sense of flow, you know, where you lose track of time. You're like, oh shit, I was supposed to go on a date. Oh well. But now you have a track, so whatever. Uh, so yeah, I strongly recommend that as well. Just have days where you do just sound design, and then you know, when inspiration strikes, make time for it. Cool. Thanks. Um, I just had a question. Uh, the mix down and mastering and I really respect that you do your own master and I appreciate that so I can ask questions like this where you know is there anything sort of counterintuitive with the mixing and mastering that you encountered or is it sort of just cut and dry listening to your ear you know mixing it down so like I said before with like the 72 hour thing you want to finish the main creative idea in that amount of time but then you do want to come back later with fresh ears usually like two or three days without listening to it at all and then objectively say like, okay, and then just take notes, listen to it all the way through and just be like, what could be improved upon? Is, you know, are certain elements getting lost? <clears throat> Do I need to bring this thing up? Um, and also like I used to be for a bit of a proponent of working with your master chain on just for like saving time and knowing how it sounds at the end. But then uh, I noticed that my ears would get fatigued a lot faster by having like that super heavy compression and stuff. So I would say, put it on sporadically. You know, just so you know, like, oh, it's going to sound like this here. But, like, you really want the mix to be tight because then you can slam it at the end and it will still sound fine. But if you, like, are already slamming it and you're already noticing things are distorting, you might just be like, oh, well, that's normal. But it's not, you know. So, um, and also, there's, if you want to send it off to, you know, have somebody mix or master your stuff, that's totally cool, man. Like, I only got into that habit because I was broke when I started and I couldn't afford to do it. And, like... Now I just like the way it sounds more than when I've given it off to somebody else to master. It's like part of my creative process. But there's no shame in, in sending it off to someone. So. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Uh, hi, Shanzi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Ramon. Yeah, hello. Oh, boy. Um, one thing I really like about your projects and your tracks in general is um, how you layer things. And I feel like that's kind of a personal struggle that I have. It's like what elements exactly get layered. And I'm assuming... Um, you kind of do a, a rough structure or something creatively in the first yeah. 72 hours and then kind of choose what to layer on later. And then Usually it's, yeah. it's actually during, I would say. Really? Yeah, so you'll be just like, well, I don't want this to sound stock. So how can I make this a more unique sound? What can I add to it or take away from it that will mm -hmm. give it the character that I'm looking for? Yeah. Um, but usually you don't want to like, like you want to have those sounds complement each other, right? So, you know, if you're doing too much to a sound, you probably need a new sound. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So... It's also like um, 
when you layer so many, when la everything is layered, you get, I feel like sometimes I get this big wall of sound and everything's just crashing into each other and it's, I guess from that point, it's just deleting and deleting. Yeah. And seeing what kind of But also, uh, so like in the other project, I had uh, basically all those elements were glued together by all having the same uh, volume automation and curves. So they were all shaped in the same way, right? So that's a way that you can get away with that wall of sound sort of idea that you hear in like a lot of Porter stuff, I would say. Like a lot of worlds is like that where it's a lot of layers, but they're all kind of like glued together, you know, via a compressor, but also by shaping that sound manually so that it, kind of comes up and down and it's not like a big mess because a lot of those things will have like different tails, different attacks, different things of that nature. So that's a good way to get away with that, I would say. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Uh, hey, Luca. Hey, what's up? <clears throat> um, my question is, uh, what's the best piece of advice you've gotten from, uh, you know, producers that you've looked up to or anything like that? Oh man, there's so much, man. I'm trying to spew as much knowledge as possible. It's hard to say like one specific thing, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, I would say just from a lot of people, it's just don't give up. You know, it's it's not easy. If it was easy, there, you know, everyone would be doing it, right? I have wanted to give up more times than I can count, but I have stuck it out longer than so many other people that I'm still here and I get to do this for a living. So yeah, that's probably the best one. How's it going, man? Hey, what's up? Doing good. Um, <laughs> just wanted to ask, when dealing with writer's block, what are some of the like, solutions you find the most helpful to kind of get over that? There's a few ways that you can approach writer's block. Uh, I used to be a big proponent of just forcing your way through it. That's not always the best idea because sometimes you'll get more frustrated that you can't do X, Y, Z. Some, a good idea is like if you're trying to write a song and you can't do it, then just make some weird sounds and then so, save them for later like we were saying before. Or just take a day off. That's, it's okay to take a day off sometimes. And you've got to like, here's the thing, like you got to find the inspiration creatively for the stuff that you're making. So that might be from having a big breakup. That might be from going and seeing a movie that really like resonates with you from just hanging out with your friends and just experiencing life. Like you want to have stuff to write about. So a lot of times when I get in one of those creative ruts now, I'll just put it down and I'll just go do something else and just, you know, I'll read a book. I'll do, I'll consume another form of media basically to, to give me ideas about what I want to convey in my own media. Sweet. Thank you. Yeah. All right, guys. One more round of applause for Luca Lush.